Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Matt Nair on Air. Jane Matt Nair, Greg Bach, Kevin Putinoff coming to you live from our studio in beautiful downtown Waukesha. You can always join the show. You can call. You can text at the same number, 855-752-4842. Leave a comment on the live stream if you're watching on Facebook YouTube and Twitter. You can also download the wonderful and absolutely free Civic Media app. And that allows you to listen to whatever show, whatever station all across the state, across the vast Civic Media Radio Network. And then you can actually call and text in directly to that show from the app. So go to your app store. It's completely free, the Civic Media app. Coming up at 1133, he joins us every other Thursday for some sports all, all things sports balls. Uh, Journal Sentinel <laughs> sports guru J.R. Radcliffe will be here at 1133. Right now, though, we are very excited to go once again beyond the cheese. Beyond the cheese. <laughs> we did it! <laughs> Smooth. That was that was smooth, guys. Nice. <laughs> guys, do not include me. Whatever. <laughs> we are delighted to be joined by Eric Knudsen from the Delafield Brew House. Good morning, Eric. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, congratulations on 25 years at the Delafield Brew House. Have you been involved with them since the very beginning? Um, I joined the brew house about about a year after my wife and I came over from uh, another local restaurant in the area. Um, but uh, yeah, we've been here for well the better part of twenty four years. That's a, that's amazing. Greg and I were talking just a little yeah. bit earlier about I can remember when you guys first opened because y- y- it was kind of a novelty at that point, right? In what nineteen ninety nine? Yep, nineteen ninety nine. So May third, ninety nine is our twenty fifth anniversary. Um, and literally, I guess you know the brew brew pub movement was just getting underway. I think mm-hmm. there was only a, a small handful of them in the state. Um, now I think we're nearing almost 300. Wow. Um, yeah. And the, the, the climate has just, has just changed. You know, I, uh, yesterday we were uh, honored uh, by uh, state rep- uh, representative Cindy Duco. Um, she gave us a, a plaque commemorating our 25th anniversary. And we had just had a great conversation about what, what, the southeast corner of you know I-94 and 83, so we're just a few minutes from downtown Delafield. What that looked like, and um, as you know, while going through some old pictures, I had a I came across an old aerial, and there just simply wasn't there much wasn't at any, all. right. Oh, there yeah. was nothing out there. A lot, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That so this was this was quite a quite a undertaking. Yeah, that whole area of 94 as you head into Delafield towards Madison. I mean. I just, I feel like, you know, I remember when it was farmland, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, there was, it was the smiley barn and the Shoney's that was it. Right. And right. now exactly. it's, it's vibrant. It's, it's, you can, I mean, there's so much going on down that area. And I remember seeing that being like, not, not what's a brew house, brew, brew house, but I was like, huh, a brew house. And that was back in the yeah. late, late nineties, early two thousands. Well, it really was pretty visionary at that time. Absolutely. Uh, they built, you know, it, it's not a small facility. It, no. It's big. You know, we, we seat, uh, we seat 300 people in the, in the main restaurant. We've got a banquet facility for 200 downstairs. Uh, the patio seats a hundred. So they went, uh, you know, they didn't hold back at all. Uh, it, it was, yeah. um, again, just being the first brew pub in Lake country. Uh, there was a lot of hoopla about it. You know, this, uh, again, the new trend starting, uh, there was an old photo I came across also for uh, Governor Thompson was here uh, during construction. So, yeah, this was this was really something. This is, uh, you know, yeah. that that all kind of legitimizes us as us after all these years becoming, you know, the country's cornerstone restaurant and brewery. I mean, that's a great that that's a great slogan too. No, uh, first in Lake Country. That's yeah. But, I mean, yeah. And, and, and it was so many like, you know, people moving into businesses and, you know, how you know, Small businesses can close and succeed back and forth. The idea of just looking at a plot of land and saying, this is what we're going to build. I mean, I've been to that place a few times. I went to a wedding there. It's just a fantastic location, and it is very, very beautiful. It's just very, very nice. I love it. Yeah, it's it's majestic. It's a grand grand building sitting up on top of the hill. Mm-hmm. And the uh, uh, the four original owners, they were, yeah, they were, they were visionaries. Um, they, they built the the building because um, they just had a love and a passion for, for beer. 
Yeah. Uh, and they wanted to have something really literally in their own backyards where they could bring fe- uh, friends and family. If you're just joining us, we are going beyond the cheese. We are celebrating the Delafield Brewhouse with Eric Knutson. They are celebrating their 25th anniversary. And it just so happens, if you're looking for a good deal, we're in Wisconsin. Who doesn't like a good deal? I love a great deal. Go to WAUKradio.com, click on the Big Deals tab, and you can get a certificate for the Delafield Brew House. It's worth 40 bucks. You can pick it up for $28. That's a deal. That's a deal. So again, go to WAUK Radio, look for the Big Deals tab on the top, and click on that, and uh, that will take you there. And there's there's wonderful, wonderful deals there. Jane, Eric, Cal, you got to excuse me. I'm going to go do some shopping. Real quick. I, got, <laughs> I got deals to get. We love a deal in Wisconsin, Eric. Everybody loves a deal, right? For sure, for sure. And we've got all sorts of fun things going on. We really started celebrating back, uh, you know, Jan 1 with um, monthly raffles. Uh, this week we're, we're holding a special raffle each day, and it uh, kind of, um, I guess the highlight would be Friday the 3rd. That's our, our true anniversary date. We're giving away a uh, trip to Germany, a $2,500 travel. Oh, wow. Uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So all the, all the raffle um, – uh, tickets that we've been collecting over the last five months will be in this hopper, and uh, someone's going to win a pretty nice trip. Eric, how, how many beers do you produce now? I would imagine things have changed since 1999, even just as far as, you know, what flavors you're coming up with. I'm always amazed by by the things that, uh, the combinations that get put together. Yeah, no, it, it, it really has changed. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, it, there was a lot of macro breweries, obviously Paps, Miller, yeah. Schlitz, that kind of thing. Never heard. Um, and you know, right? Exactly. <laughs> Small breweries. Um, but the uh, like the import, you know, the import craze. There were yeah. bottles of imports, and then then the brew pubs came along. Um, and I remember having, I guess, my first craft beer was uh, from Capital Brewery in Amber. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, this is just the greatest thing since you know sliced bread. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then to be, <laughs> and then and then to be working now at at a at a brewery. Um, and and Jane, your question, yeah, we we started out with five year uh, year round brews. Um, we have an amber, our dockside ale, Pewaukee Porter, some Rosite uh, White Spear, and then the Nagawicka Pale Ale. But now you can find anywhere from fifteen to sixteen uh, different brews on tap. Wow, uh, and and uh, yeah, so we've really expanded our portfolio, um, dove into uh, fruit beers. There's a lot of barrel aging going on right now. And, you know, back in the day, you we, we couldn't sell a hoppy beer. <laughs> Nobody had the palate for it. Now, if we don't have four or five of them on tap at all oh. times, people look at us like, you know, what what's going on here? So... Uh, um, yeah, things have really evolved. It yeah, really has. They absolutely. really have. Absolutely. Eric, I used to work for Lakefront Brewery and one of the things, you know, is like oh. is is the idea of the hoppy beer, but now they're like, I want the sour beer. They they, they want the, the giving you more yeah. bitter and robust. And one of the things that I do love about uh the brew house, and I think you're doing it right, especially with the explosion of the craft beer industry, is that you focused attention on your go tos. You've got your you've got your year rounds, your 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 Die in the wolves. They're ready to go. They're the, some people's regular beers. And then you expand it. There's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of, uh, you know, microbreweries where like, we're going to try 38 different kinds. And you're like, but which one is good all the time? So I think that's a right. very important right. aspect is like, you know, you get your, you get your starting lineup. Yeah. And then you start drafting more. Right. No yeah. pun intended. <laughs> right. That's a good one. Thank no, you. You're hundred percent correct on that. Yeah. Just, um, uh, don't, don't try to, um, uh, you know, accommodate every palate, just, you know, focus on what you do well. Yeah, absolutely. I think have done a good job on that. Yeah. yeah. You, you're going to drive sure. yourself crazy trying to, to appeal to every single person's specific yeah. taste, right? That's, that's almost impossible. Yeah. yeah, we do. We do go off the beaten path a little bit. Um, our, our head brewer, Bill, uh, white he, uh, so he brewed a, uh, peanut butter porter, which, uh, was I'll be, outstanding. I'll be there in 20 and minutes. We also, yeah, <laughs> and we also um, at the time we we're, were uh, we had a, a strawberry ale um, on tap. So he came up with the the idea of serving you know a, a, a pint of the porter and then a small glass of the strawberry. And you don't 
you know, drink them sim- simultaneously, right. but one sort of after the other. Yeah. And it tastes just like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, we like to have a little fun with it, too. So that's that's one example. Well, but, I, I... Uh, and the barrel aging side of things, just uh, um, just want to mention, too, are this. We've got a Belgian quad coming out uh, on Friday. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, Bill used... Uh, uh, Driftless Glen, um, we bought some old uh, whiskey barrels from them yeah. from the distillery in Baraboo. And this this beer has been aging for eight months, 18 months, excuse me. Uh, so it's it's just going to be one of those really, really big beers at probably uh, almost 11% ABV. Uh, definitely a sipping beer. Yeah, so that's, that's another tra- trademark brew coming up. <laughs> that's not something you pick up. Pick up a six pack and go list- or go watch the ball game. With right, just, right. That's almost after no. dinner style. Yeah, it, it's t- something to be savored. Something to be savored. Speaking of uh, right, things to savor, exactly. uh, I'm looking at your menu and your uh, French onion ale soup looks so good. So does the ha- the house made beer cheese soup. Not even close to the burgers and the pizzas. And yeah, we're coming out for lunch, uh, Eric, because you guys aren't that far from us. <laughs> live show, live show we, from Delville Brew House. Have you. Yeah. yeah, we'd love to have you. And Eric, those recipes um, haven't changed uh, since day one. So you, you mentioned some some real, uh, some real classics and signature items mm, for sure. Looks really good. We're going to put a link up to the brew house in our show notes. Yes. We're celebrating Beyond the Cheese with Eric Knutson from the Delafield Brew House, celebrating their 25th anniversary tomorrow. And just a reminder, they are part of our Civic Media Big Deals program. You can Anybody across the state can take advantage of this. Go to waukradio.com. Click on the Big Deals. You can get a $40 certificate for the brew house for $28 bucks right now. Eric, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so very, very much. And a happy anniversary. Yes, thank you so much. And, and just a big thank you goes out to all our loyal customers. I mean, they're they're really the reason the brew house has become such a iconic and local pub. Be there tomorrow and celebrate the 25th anniversary and your chance to pick up a trip to Germany as Ooh, well. Boy. Eric Knutson, thank you so very, right. very much. Stay close, everyone. You are yep. listening to Matt Nair on air. This comes to you across the vast Civic Media Radio Network. Beyond, beyond the cheese. The cheese. Welcome back to Matt Nair on Air. Jane Matt Nair, Greg Bach, the Calvinator on the board. You can always join us. Call or text at 855-752-4842. Leave a comment on the live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and or Twitter. Daily News Roundup, our news team does a really great job curating mm-hmm. news for really where you are. Exactly. So if you live in Hayward, if you live in Amory, if you live in Oshkosh, if you live in Eau Claire, it's all specially curated for you. Go to your local station, like here in Waukesha, it's waukradio.com, and then you click on a little button that says News Roundup, and they update it every day. Every day. And every day, and they do a really great job as well, so check that out. And Amory, 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 Amory. My favorite place I've never been yet. Uh, we were just celebrating this not too long ago, yeah, Greg. Yeah, literally it's, hours it ago, seemed, it felt. It seems like it was just a couple of days ago, we were all excited about... These automatic refunds that the airlines were going to have to provide for people when flights mm-hmm. get canceled yep. or delayed for hours and hours. It was last week. Yeah. The Transportation Department announced this rule requiring airlines to pay quick and automatic refunds. However, but... uh, however, eight words into the 1,069 page document. The bill says airlines must pay refunds only, quote, upon a written or electronic request of the passenger, unquote. So what happened there, Congress? Interestingly enough, Greg Bach, it seems that there were four politicians. Let me take a guess. Mm -hmm. 
those politicians have friends. Those friends run airlines. Shocking how that works, isn't it? And really quick, folks who are listening, I know what you may be thinking. Oh, my gosh, those Republicans are just trying to stick it to the man again. I'm going to have to do all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. Well, Jane, tell us about the people who wrote this little this caveat. little caveat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, one of them is Ted Cruz. <laughs> Let me put on from, my shocked face. From uh, Texas. Yeah. There were also several Democrats. Yes. Who included this. Yes. And upon a little further investigation, you know what we discovered, Greg Bach? What did we discover, Jane? Those Denner? four People who wrote this into the language just a week after we were celebrating how we consumers are finally getting a win. That sneaky little sentence. Uh, those four lawmakers get a lot of a lot of money from the aviation industry. Oh yeah, they do. They get a lot of money. I know them. everyone finds that shocking. Yeah, they're they're on the top list. Uh, the, I, 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 so if if you go to a website called OpenSecrets.org, you can find all this information out. Who gets the most money from what lobby? And yes, these individuals get quite a bit of money from the airline lobbies. And of course, you know, that transportation department made the the, uh, the, the announcement and knock comes to the door. Yeah, we need you to put this into the bill as well. Right. Which ba- essentially, in my opinion, reverses it. Yes. It just says it's going to be easy to automatically send it to you as long as you, the customer, does 85 to 95% of the legwork. That's exactly it. We didn't get what? We didn't get a week into it. Uh, we had a whole week of celebration. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's back on the customer again, which is exactly the way it was before. And airlines count on people essentially not having the time mm-hmm. to follow through on this and follow it up because it's exhausting and people have lives. I, I've i talked about it before in January. No, in summer of last year, I was coming back from Toronto and... Let next thing comes next thing, and I my plane is canceled. My flight is canceled. It's their fault. They owe me money. Yep. I, I found that out that if it's mechanical, they immediately have to issue you a refund. But that was not an easy refund to get, and that wasn't before them trying to get me onto another flight, which wouldn't have taken off for two and a half more days. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So they're not really making it easy, and it, and. This is, I get really at the airlines, especially at a time where they should be nice to us because those planes are literally falling apart out of the sky. Oh, who needs doors? Yeah. Uh, my money doesn't pay for doors. Please. But it's about, like, they don't have to focus on customer service. They say they do, but they don't have to. And I only say that when uh, pointing to another story that they're talking about. Uh, you shared this with me, that they're trying to make it that, if you're on a flight longer than an hour, you don't have the right to water. Four lawmakers quietly removed language from an aviation bill guaranteeing airplane passengers the right to drink water on flights. In 2023, the House advanced an original uh, an initial version of this bipartisan legislation that requires airlines provide drinking water to passengers on flights longer than an hour Mm -hmm. because apparently some of the more budget airlines charge you for it. Yeah. The drinking water requirement stripped from the final version of the bill by Senator Maria Cantwell, a Democrat from Washington, Mm -hmm. Senator Ted Cruz, Republican from Texas, Representative Sam Graves, uh, Republican from Missouri, and Representative Rick Larson, a Democrat from Washington. They lead their chambers Transportation Oversight Committees. And they also have deep pockets for the plane guys. This, uh, this goes back to Tom from L.A. says this all the time. We need to get money out of politics. We absolutely do. But I don't know how how that's ever going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. But also, I'd like to say thank you, politicians, for making it that I can't expect a three and a three and a half ounce cup of water on a flight. Unless you pay for it. Unless I pay for it. Or you could buy a $9 bottle of water before you get on the flight. As long as you do it after you're checked in. Exactly. Don't do it before you go through security. Yeah. So. Carmela from Milwaukee is on the line. Carmela, we only got about a minute and a half left. Thank you so much for calling. What do you want to say? 
Um, I wanted to say I'm confused by, I, I thought the bill was passed by President Biden. So how can they retract part of the bill? Well, I'm you looking, know? yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Again, I don't think it had been signed. And so they made some ultimate, they made, they slipped these changes in at the last minute. We'll see where this goes. Uh, again, we were celebrating this last week. It looked like such a good thing. And we just can't have nice things. No. Thank you, Carmela. Yeah. Appreciate your call. We'll follow up on that and see where the status of this is. Oh, the status will be, you will pay. And they're also not going to make any requirements about seat sizes either. Oh, no, they're going to get they're smaller. Gonna keep, they're going to keep shrinking on us. And they're making concessions, quote unquote, for people who need two seats by charging you. And then possibly so, there's an airline, I think it might be Southwest, where you can buy two seats if you absolutely need one. And they'll refund you after the fact for one of them. I don't know. It, once again, they don't have to be good to us. We need them. That's the unfortunate part, because I'm not taking a boat to Mallorca. <laughs> All right. News is on the way next. And when we return, Journal Sentinel sports guru J.R. Radcliffe will be here. It's a uh, win or die tonight for the Milwaukee Bucks and Brewers and umpires. <laughs> that discussion's <sighs> on the way as well. Stay close. You're listening to Matt Nair on air, coming to you across the Civic Media Radio Network. Welcome to Matt Nair on air. Jay Matt Nair, Greg Mock, Calvin on the board. You can always join our conversation. Call or text at 855-752-4842. Leave a comment if you're watching on the live stream on Facebook, YouTube, or the platform. Elon continues to ruin. He is here every other Thursday at this time to talk all things sports balls. J.R. Radcliffe is a Journal Sentinel sports guru. Good morning, J.R. Thanks for joining us. How you doing? Good morning. I'm doing quite well. How are you guys doing today? We're good. We're excited. We're a little bit nervous. Win, uh, stay alive tonight or or die. Bucks at the Pacers. Game at 5 o'clock. You can listen to the game. News from the center, WRCE in Richland Center, or on Oshkosh Air Support, WISS 98.3 FM, 1100 AM. JR, our very own Calvin was at the game the other night in which the Bucks won. We kind of are giving... Calvin, the credit for that. And now without him at the game tonight, we're all a little uneasy. Uh, how do you think this is going to go? Well, I think Calvin has time. If he <laughs> leaves this second, he's going to make it. I'm he telling can do you, this. They pick him up. Get, get him on a, a limo. plane. Get him on a, get a, him limo. a limo. This is important, the Bucks. Yeah, they need, uh, they need you, Calvin. They need as much help as they can get. But really, they just need a positive vibes from the in injury report. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it really yeah. is that simple. Uh, as of right now... You know, as we're talking here, it's still doubtful that Giannis and Damian Lillard are going to play. I am sure they are doing everything under their, you know, humanly possible to get out on the court. I just, game five was, you know, that was kind of an important inflection point to me because I thought, well, yes, I know they're hurt. But if you're not going to play an elimination game, that means you're still really, really hurt, right? And I don't think two days can necessarily be the difference between being really, really hurt and playable, you know? So, even if they're available, I mean, best case scenario, let's say they they are able to make it out there. You wonder what they can give you, how much, you know, how how many minutes can they go? How yeah. much effectiveness can they bring you? And I mean, I still think it's worth the, well, easy for me to say I'm not the one whose injuries <laughs> are in the, in the crosshairs. It seems like it would be worth the risk because, you know, I, I don't think this Bucks team for as good as they were two nights ago can realistically win twice more against the Pacers. So it's a, it is still do or die. And there's, you know, they, there will be time, unfortunately to, to rest of it, it, you know, if they lose one of these next two games, but 
I, I, I don't know. I, I, I am still, I know there's some optimism out there. I'm still a little dubious that we're going to see, even if we see both of them play, we're going to see like a fully realized version of them. Now, maybe that's enough. They did, they did win game five. They yep. did win that game. So maybe that extra additive is just what it takes to be a Pacers team that I think is still kind of beatable. They're not, they don't like blow me out of the water. I think it's just a, uh, it's just a situation where I don't I don't know what they're going to have in the gas tank if they don't get those two guys back. Calvin, yesterday you spoke on this a little bit regarding the injury of Giannis and that you feel that it's being underplayed versus the fact that it looks like it's a little more serious than it actually is. I Yeah, I'm not sure. I think the fact that he's left as doubtful until the last possible minute every single game might be a little bit of psychological warfare. Like, I think they might be, like, trying to get in the Pacers' head that they do have to prepare for Giannis, even though he's not going to be there. So it's a little psych. Yeah, that's what yeah. the direction I lean in. I think Indiana's a young, rattable, shakeable team, I guess is a more easier word to say. Rattleable? Yes, that's what I was going for at first. Um, They're young. They've never been here before. I think there's potential for them to feel the pressure in a subsequent elimination games after losing the one they should have had on Tuesday. It sounds more like psychological warfare on us. <laughs> <laughs> We're the ones going, is he going to play? Is he going to? No. I mean, I think, I think Calvin is absolutely right. You know, they're, they're a team that hasn't been in the playoffs in a few years. A lot of young guys, Tyrese Halliburton has never played in the playoffs. They got to figure out how to close it out. You know, that's, that's, that's new for them. And, you know, like if, if they're, if you're, if you have that lingering doubt, whether or not Giannis is going to play, I, I could see that. I think Doc Rivers is so different from other coaches. You know, other coaches would be so hesitant to give any modicum of information about their health status. Mm -hmm. And Doc is out here kind of fueling the hope and the speculation after the, after game five, he said, uh, all, all I can say is they're very, very, very close. That's three varies for those keeping track. <laughs> I don't do trust that man at all anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> How can you not feel like three varies means, oh, they're going to play. They're definitely going to play. He's very, Doc, very, he very. They're close before and then they yeah. don't play. So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I will at this. I, I think in the past I was more like, I'll believe Giannis doesn't play when I see it. I have flipped. I feel like Giannis, I'll, I'll believe that Giannis is going to play when I see it. Well, and you certainly don't want, as you kind of alluded to, Jr. You don't want them coming out if they aren't completely healed. That's not going to help anybody because yeah. if they injure themselves more, even if they would win the game tonight, you know that then then what? So, well, we certainly yeah. hope everybody gets healthy or as healthy as they yeah. can be, and maybe the you know the glow of Calvin will will follow them to Indiana, and yeah. uh, and they can bring it home. It's it's also tricky. You're messing with the uh, the Achilles area of your of your leg, and you know the doctor I I spoke to at the very beginning didn't seem to think that the Achilles was in grave danger. At least in Giannis's case, we don't know a lot about Damian Lillard's situation, but you just don't mess around with that because if let's say you get a damaged Achilles, like that is a lot of next year, if not all of next year, yeah. that but, you could be missing. I mean, isn't that a career? That's pretty much a career ender if you tear your Achilles. That's I mean, I know yeah, you I mean, can come back from it, but. Right. Not good. Yeah, sports medicine is pretty good. Like I would say it's probably not career ending for everybody, but it's it's not something, you know, there is a cost to getting more hurt in this case that would extend beyond this season, I think. One of the things I heard talking about earlier in the uh, on Up North News Radio with Pat Kreitler, who's talking to our friend Joe Zapecki, is that uh, Giannis, is, he wants to play every game, start to finish. And there's no sense of, and, and, and they brought it in with the idea that people are calling for shorter regular seasons because this constant playing is creating agitating and 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 destroying players because they just don't stop and they're never being pulled off the and you what are you gonna tell Giannis you don't get to play until you're hurt that's you know you got to take care of yourself they don't want to hear this they want to play yeah well and throw in a new variable this year in that the NBA because yeah, they have all these games, but they don't want to see stars sit out. There'd been like what the NBA, I think, would term an epidemic of star players just sitting out games just for maintenance or, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, load management was the very popular that's, terminology. Yes. Well, yes, that's what they said this morning. He's not a, he's not big on load management. 
And and then they introduced this stipulation that if you want to win MVP, you have to play an X number of games. You have to play in it. Like Joel Embiid, for example, who had a pretty de- decent sized injury, completely ineligible to win MVP this year because he missed X, X number of games. So now it's like, well, if you want that hardware, I mean, Giannis played a lot of games this year. Damian Lillard played a lot of games this year. You can you can see why a player might now err on the side of not resting themselves. Yeah. And here's what you got. And it isn't just these guys. It's Jimmy Butler. It's Kawhi Leonard. Like, there are some stars here at this point of the year. You can't draw a direct line, I would say, yet. It's just the first year that they've done this. But yeah. tell you what, it's, it's I don't know, like, that's it's, a, it's an existential challenge. You know, and no league is going to subtract money-making opportunities and, and take games off of the schedule. Mm-hmm. But if you want your stars to be at your best at the time when the stars, you know, are winning championships, then you have to allow for the regular season to be a little bit of a training ground and not actually, you know, the main, the main, main event. Yeah. If you're just joining us, Journal Sentinel sports guru, J.R. Radcliffe is here. We are talking all things sports. Uh, let's move on to the Brewers and um, Brewers versus umpires. What What is going on with that? <laughs> Jeez. You know, we really felt good about toward the end of the game Wednesday that we were going to, for the first time in four games, not have some sort of umpire weirdness. And then in the ninth inning, they took the glove of the pitcher, Chiago Vieira, which in like completely understandably looks like it, it has a gray tone to It's a two-toned glove, and you're not supposed to have a gray or a white glove because that can kind of mask the baseball. So they don't want that. He had pitched with it the day before. And so now all of a sudden they cared about that glove and they're going to take it off. It's like, great. Even, even today, when there's no craziness, we get a little bit of, umpire zaniness but it has been really interesting we've yeah. had oh go ahead well they're gonna say that on, it was it was saturday correct aaron judge doesn't get called for sunday, interference yep. sunday right. and then the yep. very next day we get called for interference yes against the yankees so i don't yeah, that one against the rays but it was oh, it, the rays. It, and, and different circumstances but all of these calls have gone against the brewers like yeah. it's been a it's been a rash of them I really don't do conspiracy theories. I haven't the time nor the mental bandwidth. But when it comes to the MLB's just absolute despising the Brewers, I believe. And I mean, what was it? It was 2018. We did so well. They instituted new rules because we were playing so well. Well, I mean, agree with me, JR. I love love a good conspiracy, Greg. I love it. I love conspiracies. (laughs) I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, but like, um, so there were some new rules that it involves uh, three better minimums and things like that, where the brewers were sort of taking advantage of uh, the brewers just, they, they maximize their roster. They used, they used a couple little quirks that, that I think ultimately baseball decided just not for the brewers specifically, but Overall, we're a good thing. We can get into that. That's kind of water under the bridge, but you're not wrong, Greg. You're not wrong about some of that. You heard stuff. it here, they folks. definitely found a way. A well, sports guru said I was right. Couldn't they just possibly all these umpires becoming a little power mad? It's like, <laughs> wah, there's only this many of us, and I'm one of them. So take well, the, that. They're living under the threat of being replaced by robots. Mm, there's always true. that discussion. There's always that. I saw would they been, ever really do that. They would. <laughs> they would. They have to perfect the science, though. It's that's the issue right now. The robots aren't that good yet. Yeah. <laughs> Once they get good enough, I, I think maybe. I no matter my my qualms with with umpires, and I have a lot of them this season. Uh, I don't want to see that happen. I just I think there's something about a little bit of human error because it's a game of human error. You can't perfect the game whether you're uh, in the field, on the mound, or. Batting. Well, but, if we're gonna if we're gonna have robots as umpires, then just have robots as players. Mm, that's a good idea. I like that. Uh, <laughs> take, no. take, just take uh, humans out of it altogether, and we're you know so it's Mark be Antonaz- a great game. Mark Antonazio will never go for it. He'd have to pay money for them. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> hey, oh sticking it. it to power. Oh. Um, so just to be clear, the robot piece is really just for balls and strikes, like having an automated strike zone. You would actually still have a human being behind home plate hearing what's the call, what the call is and then providing that the plays in the field would still be adjudicated by human beings so like we're not we're not like totally there yet and the the process needs to get tweaked it's it's been it's been in the minors we've, we've had a lot had a lot of work on it uh i don't know how close we are but as far as the umpires here at the brewers the they admitted they got that Aaron Judge call wrong on Sunday that they should have called interference the Yankees went on to score 7 runs that inning it was a 10 run game i have a hard time believing the brewers win that game anyway but you can at least make the argument that that was a really important miss and it, they admitted it was a miss it's just a bad look when it's the 
it's the biggest team and one of the biggest players. Oh, yeah. It looks like favoritism. And then the very next night we get caught. I mean, it just doesn't. It's a bad look. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's I think there's a bit of an ump problem. I just saw a video of an ump not allowing the team dog to bring a bat off. And they like he took it out of the mouth of the dog. Some of these guys are just mean. I don't like them. Yeah. Make it stop, JR and Jane. <laughs> I think I think the issue of transparency is is the thing that people really are frustrated with. Sometimes these calls get made, and there is a little bit of information, but but there are there are umpires that everyone knows are really bad, and nothing really seems to get done about it. Yeah. There's one guy in particular, uh, Angel Hernandez. I yeah. mean, that's a name everyone kind of knows around baseball. So it would be nice if there was maybe a little bit more. I would say that in this case, like the Monday play where the Brewers were called for backswing interference, I don't understand that rule. I think the rule is really trash. The uh, the adjudication of it was correct. They, they they handled it correctly as the rule book indicates. It makes no sense to me as a rule. I think, you know, if we're talking about changing the rules for something that happened in a Brewer game, that should be, you know, case study number one. Uh, and then uh, and then the Tuesday, they, they eject an, a pitcher that I, you know, I think it's highly debatable that he was throwing at the batter that he hit with a pitch. I, I think it's, I think it's pretty unnecessary for them to have ejected the pitcher right away. And I think that ends up leading to elevated temperature teams going at yeah. each other. You know, mm -hmm. if, if de-escalation is part of their job, they didn't handle that well. So definitely areas where I think the umpires could have done things differently. I don't think, I don't think anyone's out to get the brewers. I do not think there's a conspiracy. <laughs> not yet. I'm always willing to be convinced of a good conspiracy <laughs> theory though. I love diving off the deep end. We, we got a couple of weeks. We'll see what Greg can come I'll up with you. Be before you come back. <laughs> J.R. Radcliffe is with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He joins us every other Thursday at this time to talk about sports. Thank you so much, J.R. We'll see you in a couple. All right. See you soon. One break left. Stay close and stay with us. You're listening to Matt Nair on air. This is the Civic Media Radio Network. Welcome back to Matt Nair on Air. Jane Matt Nair, Greg Bach, the Calvinator on the board. Coming to you from our studio in downtown Waukesha, 855-752-4842. If you would ever like to join the conversation, you can leave a comment on the live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and or Twitter. News is coming up at noon, followed by the wonderful Todd Alba from noon to 2 p.m. and Maggie Dawn from 2 to 4. So stay with us all throughout the day. Lots of good stuff coming your way. We're going to stop, uh, wrap things up today with yeah. a little Christy Nome cricket update. Christy Nome, the <sighs> governor of South Dakota. We talked about this, I think, Monday. Yeah. Out with a new book where she talks about how she can handle doing tough things because she had a hunting dog that she hated. And so she took it to a gravel pit and shot it along with a male goat. Mm -hmm. That had apparently not been castrated and could be aggressive and violent with kids. Yeah. Then I would and, and then I would think you would castrate the goat. Yeah, I don't really. Uh, she feel like also that was the she also fault. shot she also shot the goat. Mm -hmm. But now she's she's saying this is all fake news. That's not what happened. <laughs> People are are misconstruing what I said. In no, the, we're, no, we're not. We're just saying the words you said. He's the, in the book. In yeah. the book, Noam says her description of killing a dog and goat illustrates her willingness to do anything, quote, difficult, messy, and ugly, unquote, in politics, as well as on her farm in South Dakota. Noam says Cricket ruined a pheasant hunt and then killed a neighbor's chickens while presenting a picture of pure joy. I hated that dog, she writes. That Cricket tried to bite her, proved herself untrainable, less than worthless at a, as a hunting dog. At that moment, Noam says, I realized I had to put her down. Again, she's, she's completely just, you know, nope, I, I stand by this. I did this. 
And I guess good for her. If you're going to own it, you put it in the book. Although I'm trying, I'm the, uh, who was defending her? Oh, I think it, it was someone on Fox. A psychopath? It was someone on Fox who said maybe she didn't know that was going to be in the book and someone just slipped it in there to make her look bad. <laughs> My God. <laughs> God. Okay. So first of all, this is giving me very January six vibes in the sense of here's the thing that happened. Here's the information we have. Nope. I'm changing the information. You know what I mean? Like she said, she, she said she did it four days ago, four, not four months, four years or 40, four days ago. She said, I did this. You have to do these things. You have to make tough decisions, tough decisions. Hmm. That was an that was a dumb decision because once once we've talked about this and other people have as well. Get it to a better trainer. Get it to classes. If you can't do it, give it to the Humane Society. There are options, not just well, it, it ate a chicken and looked at me and smiled. I guess we're gonna put a bullet in an old cricket's head. 855 Seven five civic. Leave a comment on the live stream, Facebook, YouTube. What used to be Twitter? Carmela on the line again. Good morning, Carmela. What did you want to say about this? We only got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, good. Um, I have a pin on my purse that says, "Being a good human matters," and mm-hmm. I think that's enough said about this this woman and all these people, vile people. I I might add. Um, but I actually I missed Jr. and I wanted to ask about the box. Um, and maybe the Calvinator can help, but what if they think about uh, Thanasis out of San Cupo being a bench warmer and never being played? And what's the point of having him besides being a cheerleader for Giannis when everybody else is trying to step up? And this is the time that I really miss through holidays. Thanks, Carmela. Uh, Calvinator, uh, can you answer Carmela's question? I think... Him being a cheerleader for Giannis is honestly the biggest reason he's on the team. Really? Yeah, I think it's one of those things you have one of the best players in the NBA. He is on a big contract. He has a lot of leverage where he's at, so it's like you keep his brother around to make him happy. But I will say he was offered a contract on another team in the offseason. He's not a terrible player. There's 12 roster spots. A lot of times only eight or nine players get in the game. So there's other factors of why he's not doesn't play that much. I'm, the knowledge being dropped by the Calvinator. Here. I think Calvin's is a sports show. Uh, I'm also just <laughs> announcing today that I'm changing my name to Greg Antetokounmpo. I will take, I'll, I'll be a cheerleader. I'll sit on the bench. That bench will never hit the ceiling. My <laughs> big butt will be on that bench cheering on my brother Giannis. Go Bucks. Thank you for calling, Camrella. Thank you, as always, very much for listening. Uh, I wanted to wrap this up because on Twitter this morning, there is now a political caucus of dog lovers. So headed by Jared Moskowitz from Florida mm-hmm. and also Nancy Mace, who is yeah. a Republican. And now politicians from all sides of the aisle are taking pictures with their dogs and forming the pro not let's not kill our dogs caucus, which I have to kind of like. There are better things to do with their time. There are many better things yeah. they could do with their time. But as Carmela said, I think we can all agree that don't do that. Yeah, be a good human. Yeah. I, I be, a, same, be a good human to other creatures. Jack from Merrimack texts in saying, I hated that, quote unquote, I hated that dog. So she killed it. Sort of tells you what she'll encourage her cultists to do to whatever or whomever they hate. Now, that is a very um, uh, big statement, Jack. But But the thing is, is people like that, when you disappoint them, what will your punishment be? And if they run the country, what are they going to do to the people that, quote unquote, disappoint them or disagree with them? They're going to have these hardline opinions on what should be done to them, whether it's taking away the right to vote, lock them in jail or worse, because they have to make what, Jane? The hard decisions. decisions. So, yeah, that kind of I mean, that's I'm sorry. That's psychopathic, psychopathic behavior to say, like, I killed the dog because it bit it bit me. What are you doing? Well, we're going to leave it there for today. News. Have a good Thursday. News is coming up next.
Todd Alba will be here from noon to 2. Maggie Dawn from 2 to 4 p.m. Greg and Calvin and our engineers, thank you so much. Without you, nothing works. Thank you most of all for texting and for calling and for listening. It means everything. I hope you find some joy today and you have the chance to share it. Keep it right here on the Civic Media Radio Network.